Okay, the next item of business is a debate on motion 6437 in the name of Jackie Bailey on supporting the NHS in winter. I invite members who wish to participate in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Jackie Bailey to speak to and move the motion for around six minutes, Ms Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I received an email at 8pm last night. It was from a man who had taken his mother to the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital with chest pains. He told me that a member of staff had just come into the packed waiting room to announce the following. There is an eight-hour wait to be initially reviewed. There are 14 ambulances waiting to be processed. If your issue is not life-threatening, go home and call your GP tomorrow. And he went on to say, the SNP and the current not-fit-for-purpose health minister are running this country into the ground. His words, presiding officer, not mine. But there is no mistaking the anger. And this is not an isolated incident. Thousands of people are waiting more than eight hours every week across Scotland. These delays, no, these delays have the most serious of consequences. The Royal College of Emergency Medicine tell us that delays in A&E lead to worse outcomes and ultimately cost lives. The NHS stands on the brink of a humanitarian crisis. The hardworking staff are doing their very best but they are exhausted. They get angry when the Health Secretary doesn't hear what they are saying, and they are in despair at the lack of support for them and for their patients. Maybe the Health Secretary will listen to the BMA, who have said, the system just doesn't work properly anymore. Staffed by people on their knees and genuinely at the brink of what they can cope with, some honesty from our politicians on the scale of the challenge will help with this. And then finally, we may start to address the need to make sure our NHS is sustainable for the future. But the complacency in the SNP amendment today suggests that the Health Secretary's fingers are well and truly in his ears. So what about the Royal College of Emergency Medicine? They've said that many of the components of the SNP's winter resilience plan, and I quote, will not be in place to prevent further harm to patients and staff this winter? Or how about the view from the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, who tell us that the solution lies in properly funding social care to tackle delayed discharge and therefore free up hospital beds? Again, again the Health Secretary is deaf to the solutions because he knows better than the health experts. And, presiding officer, his winter resilience plan has no new resources. That's right, not a single penny extra. All of the money has been pre-announced, some of it over 11 months ago. Social care, we know, has been underfunded by more than a decade, and the health secretary's repackaged, reheated and recycled funding announcement is a pathetic excuse for urgent action. In fact, he is currently raiding the budgets of GPs and health and social care partnerships at a time when they need the money the most. But it gets worse. Cosler tell me that despite asking, the Health Secretary has provided no detailed plan about what needs to be done in social care to help with the impending winter crisis. Not one single iota of detail, and winter is here. Presiding officer, I have been in Parliament for 23 years, and I can say without fear of contradiction that Hamza Youssef is absolutely the worst health secretary since devolution. Let's, 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 let's prove this. Let's look at his predecessors. Nicola Sturgeon. 95.9% .9 of people seen within four hours at A&E in October 2011. Alex Neil, 93.9% .9 in October 2013. No, no, I'm praising your ministers. You might want to listen. <laughs> Shona Robson, 91% in October 2015. Jean Freeman, 89.6% in October 2020. Let me remind you, that's eight months into the same pandemic that this health secretary blames all his failings on. And our missing in action health secretary presides over record lows of 64%. But presiding officer, the waits of over eight hours and 12 hours are now at record highs. Literally thousands of patients 
three, more than 3,000 waiting over three hours and 1,300 waiting over 12 hours in the last week alone. That means that as many as 37 people could have lost their lives because of the delays in that week. Patients waiting on trolleys, getting intravenous drugs administered in corridors which is not safe, sleeping in chairs overnight. This is the new normal in accident and emergency. And it was, of course, a fraction of the current figure back in October 2020, when no more than 350 people in any week during the month waited over eight hours to be seen. That's the difference. Finally, I want to talk, turn to talking about the doctors and nurses and other NHS workers who are the backbone of our NHS. The Health Secretary is very fond of telling us that the NHS has record levels of staff. What he fails to tell us is that they're coping with record levels of demand and they are doing so with record levels of vacancies. Almost 7,000 nursing vacancies alone, a critical shortage of GPs and other allied professionals, patient safety being compromised on a regular basis, and successive years of failure to workforce plan. The latest pay offer helps the lowest paid the most, but for many skilled and experienced nurses, the pay offer is less than the 5% previously promised. Nurses' pay has declined by 17% in real terms. Inflation is now at 10%. This is not a fair pay deal, and now nurses in Scotland are being balloted on strike action. Presiding officer, let me finish with this. Our NHS is on its knees. The Health Secretary has a choice, because doing nothing is not a choice. He needs to stop people needlessly dying this winter. So his choice is set out a clear plan to end waiting times of more than eight hours because this is about saving lives. And if he can't do that, frankly, he must resign. Ms Bailey, you need to move the, move the motion. I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much indeed. I now call on the Cabinet Secretary to speak to a move amendment 6437.1 for around five minutes, please, Cabinet Thank Secretary. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I move the amendment uh, in my name? I'm eager to respond uh, to this debate and outline our continuing NHS recovery from COVID-19, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there is nobody in this government, not I, nor indeed actually my colleagues in the seats behind me, who deny that the NHS is under significant pressure. Of course it is. However, for Labour to bring forward a motion about NHS pressures and not to include one single word, not a solitary mention about COVID and the pandemic, yeah. demonstrates just how it is Jackie Bailey and her party who have their fingers in their ears and not this government. The pandemic is the biggest shock our NHS has ever faced in its 74-year existence. I have no doubt that, of course, the NHS had challenges pre-pandemic. I will not. You will have your moment, uh, I am sure. The, I have no doubt that the NHS had, had challenges pre-pandemic. But for Labour not to recognise that COVID has been the biggest shock they have faced is, frankly, burying their head in the sand. Let us remember Absolutely. there are 800 people in our hospitals now who, as we speak, are suffering the effects of the virus. Yeah. There are still people dying families grieving due to the loss of COVID. Any realistic, pragmatic uh, discussion on the NHS in Scotland cannot simply cast aside the impact of the pandemic. It is central to those challenges we face. And that's why central to our recovery is that successful vaccination programme, COVID and flu vaccination programme. And I want to thank our staff who are involved. The NHS will not recover in weeks, as Jackie Bailey is demanding it does, or even months. It will take years. That's why the £1 billion recovery plan is predicated on five years of substantial investment and reform. I am certainly committed uh, to that recovery. And one uh, central plank to that recovery is taking care of our workforce. And I have offered, uh, as Jackie Bailey has referenced, uh, in the past week, our NHS staff a record pay rise, £2,200, an average 7% uplift to help to tackle the cost of living crisis. It means the lowest paid, seeing a rise of more than 11%. And qualified nursing staff, because she mentioned nursing staff, a, a, quali a qualified nursing staff receiving up to 8.45%. If agreed, the uplift will amount to almost half a billion pounds, the largest single year pay offer ever given 
to a gender for change staff. Better paid, if it is accepted, that means our NHS staff in Scotland better paid than staff in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And I want to give them my thanks once again. Of course I will. Thank you, Bailey. Can you maybe explain why NHS nurses are actually balloting for strike action if he's been so generous? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there are still, of course, unions meeting to discuss the, recent, uh, the, the, the latest pay deal. So I'll let those unions have those discussions, and my door will be open to try to stop uh, industrial action from taking place. And I hope that NHS members, when they see the detail of this deal, will accept it. In terms of waiting times, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, it is untrue to say that there has not been no progress. Uh, in the NHS in terms of its recovery, uh, even while we're in the midst of this pandemic. If I give you one example in terms of long waits, since I announced the planned care waiting times targets this summer, the latest figures from Public Health Scotland show that 76%, 31 out of 41, outpatient specialities have no or fewer than 10 patients waiting more than 10 years, while 60% of inpatient, inpatient day cases uh, specialities have fewer than 10 patients waiting more in two years. This is demonstrable progress, and my thanks to our brilliant NHS staff for it. There is no doubt that delayed, discharge is, delayed discharges are too high. We know that they are real challenges in social care. That is why one of the first things I did coming into this role was to ensure not just one, but two pay up lifts yeah. for our adult social care staff. But we know there are challenges in the social care sector. We know our care homes have been hit by a triple whammy of Brexit, the pandemic, and high inflation and energy costs. Two out of three, of course, of these factors are as a result of the Conservatives putting ideology above the very yeah. interests of the country. And it's clear our social care sector is the one paying the price. So I met on Tuesday again with chief executives of local authorities, health boards, chief officers of health and social care partnerships, and we will do everything we can uh, to support them. In terms of A&E, uh, presiding officer, of course, uh, those pressures are being driven by those uh, pressures that I have mentioned and delayed uh, discharges. But we have put £50 million towards our urgent and unscheduled care collaborative programme. And while, of course, the level of performance is not where I would want it to be, and I agree entirely with the RCM and indeed Jackie Bailey's assessment that long waits do harm uh, to patients, we will do everything we can to take a whole systems approach to reduce those pressures in A and E. But, presiding officer, to end, uh, we must uh, be frank that we face a very, very difficult winter ahead. The accumulative pressures of the pandemic, the pressures of flu, the usual winter pressures of slips, trips and falls. And therefore, my focus and that of the government's will be to spend every single waking moment supporting our NHS and the staff that work within it. We have in Scotland the best paid staff. We have in Scotland more GPs per head than in England, more dentists per head, more NHS frontline staff per head yeah. under this government. And yes, challenges do persist, but there are shoots of recovery. Let me finish by acknowledging that while this winter will be one of the most difficult our NHS has ever dealt with, uh, I want to praise our NHS and social care staff for the incredible compassionate care they provide the people of Scotland day in and day out, and give them an absolute promise that we will honour them, not just with words, but through our deeds. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Can I remind the Chamber we do not have any time in hand and therefore members are going to have to stick to their um, allocated time limits. With that, I call Sandish Gulhani to speak to and move Amendment 6437.2 uh, for up to four minutes. Dr Gulhani. People are dying. People are dying avoidable deaths and it will get worse over winter. Across the country, the Scottish Government continues to fail our Scottish National Health Service and fail our patients. And to be clear, this is not the fault of our hard-working clinical and support staff who have and always will go beyond the call of duty. But these heroes really are at breaking point. And the Cabinet Secretary should know this. And he would know this if he had bothered to face the front line when he's, one, when he's on one of his well-documented PR drop-ins to one of our hospitals. Cabinet Secretary, you just thank and praised our staff, but you avoided Dr Moy in A&E when you went. The debate is about responsibility and accountability. So let's consider the facts. Under the SNP, waiting times for A&E and cancer treatment are at their worst ever levels. In the second quarter of this year, more than one in 10 patients waited longer than 84 days to begin treatment, with one in 20 waiting 116 days. We even had one patient left 
322 days until treatment began, and we're talking about cancer. As for routine treatments, over 7,000 people are languishing on inpatient waiting lists for more than two years. With the SNP breaking its promise to eradicate waiting lists longer than 24 months by September. And while we're on the subject of broken promises, a near record number of patients are having their discharge from hospital delayed because there's no follow on social care package in place or space in residential care. Yet, the SNP promised to solve the problem of delayed discharge by the end of 2015. The Cabinet Secretary is also failing our most vulnerable children. Over a quarter of young people referred to mental health services are not being seen within 18 weeks, yet the government's own target is 90%. I could go on, but I will run out of time. But it's fair to say that there is a catalogue of failures under the SNP's watch. And as I underscored in the Scottish Conservatives NHS debate last month, we have a record-breaking Cabinet Secretary. The trouble is, he's breaking the wrong kind of records. Now, the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary will come to this chamber and make announcements, usually in the form of new spending plans. And yes, they are good. No, they are great at spending taxpayers' money, but they cannot actually deliver results or even a squeaky clean bill of health under the auditors. Let's take September 2021, the announcement of £10 million for long COVID. Well, what happened? Come May this year, we found that 10 million was actually 3 million over three years. And we still don't actually know where this money is being spent. And let's not forget that during this time, the number of Scots with long COVID has risen from around 90,000 to 200,000. That's more than the population of Aberdeen. It's just about headlines for this cabinet secretary. Winter is now fast approaching. And it's plain to see that the SNP Green government is ill-prepared and its NHS recovery and winter plan is inadequate. Any waiting times alone are spiralling out of control. We're calling on the Cabinet Secretary to go back to the drawing board and set out a clear plan to get our health services and patients through the next six months. And we want to see more spending announcements that actually have a clear target that can be audited. Patients taxpayers have a right to know how this government is spending their money. It's a declaration of interest. I'm a practicing NHS doctor and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Gohani. I now call on Alex Cole Hamilton for up to four minutes, Mr. Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much indeed, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm grateful very much to my friend Jack Jackie Bailey for securing time for this important debate in the Chamber. And, Presiding Officer, it is a timely debate. Um, I cannot remember a time when our NHS was in such a state or when our valiant doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals were under so much strain. And had the Cabinet Secretary taken my intervention, I would have reminded him that this is not solely the impact of our pandemic, the pandemic we have just been through. In fact, the former Chief Executive of NHS Scotland, Paul Gray, reminds us that this uh, was a crisis years in the making. COVID just hastened its arrival. It is wrong for him to say otherwise, and it is offensive to the people that are carrying the cost of this government's negligence day in, day out. I must say, as grateful as I am that we are having this debate, I can't help but feel a depressing sense of deja vu. It feels as though we're part of Groundhog Day here. Um, each time we come here armed as opposition parties with the latest round of disastrous health and social care statistics, and each time the government responds with reference to the pandemic and vague promises to make things better, or often they just try to blame something on everyone else. Small wonder then that the SNP and Green government do not make time for this in their own parliamentary time. It is impossible to overstate the crisis that is engulfing our health service. Everyone knows somebody who is on a waiting list, whether that be a partner arriving, or they know somebody who's suffering, whether that's a partner arriving home late after another brutal ward shift, or an elderly parent forced to wait hours on a hospital gurney or weeks just to speak to their GP on the phone. The Cabinet Secretary's NHS recovery and winter plan falls woefully short. They're already missing their own interim waiting targets. And there's nothing that will make a material difference ahead of the inevitable strain of winter. And the first frosts haven't yet arrived. Presiding officer, the stakes here are literally life and death. And more than a year uh, for more than a year, waiting times in A&E have steadily risen, tragically resulting in hundreds of avoidable deaths this year alone. 
Yet last month, the SNP and Green Government voted down my party's proposal to hold an inquiry to look at those avoidable emergency care deaths. This is reprehensible. The more apparent the cost of this government incompetence becomes, the more they will try to distract attention away from their failures and instead the mythical vagaries of Scottish independence, which is, I think, the root cause of ministerial disinterest here. During her keynote speech, I remind the Chamber that at the recent SNP conference, the First Minister mentioned the NHS just 11 times. That's compared to 58 mentions of breaking up the United Kingdom. She had nothing to say on social care. And don't get me started on long COVID. I associate my remarks um, with those of Dr Gilhani. Uh, we now see over 200,000 sufferers of this debilitating condition. It is perhaps the biggest mass disabling event since the First World War. And we are nowhere. We're spending twice as much money on an independence referendum as we are on assisting those people. This is the same old story. It does nothing to help beleaguered nurses, doctors, patients left abandoned in our A&E departments. And the impact, the impact of government failure is felt right across the health and social care story. The devastating story we heard this afternoon from Jackie Bailey at the top of her remarks is a story told the country over. Ambulances not getting to people in time because they can't dis discharge patients into emergency wards when they arrive because A&E is full to the rafters with patients unable to be admitted into the wider hospital due to lack of beds. On any given night, more than a thousand people are languishing in Scottish hospitals well enough to go home, but too frail to do so without a social care package. And even when the care packages are arranged, too often those in need are still being let down. The blame here does not lie with staff. For years now, they've worked tirelessly, diligently, under enormous physical and emotional strain, and their reward is unfair pay and unimaginable working conditions. Were Liberal Democrats in government, we would support staff immediately with a burnout prevention strategy and a NHS staff assembly to set national standards to get rid of the postcode lottery that currently exists in social care. Presiding officer, this government loves to talk about a far off distant land where everything will be better, but they have neither the desire nor the to, conclude, Mr. to make things better today. So I say to the government, the cabinet secretary, either get it sorted or step out, outside, step out of the way to make some room for someone who can. Thank you very much. I now, we now move to the open debate. I call first Carol Mochen to be followed by Gillian Martin for uh, up to four minutes. Ms. Mochen. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It has been a busy week for bad news across the UK. So, understandably, I think the Scottish Government were hoping for their own failings to drift under the radar. But with winter approaching, we need to get serious and do so quickly about the significant problems the Government's management of our NHS. They are putting lives at risk. There is a crisis in A&E across Scotland, and quite frankly, the Cabinet Secretary has been missing in action for a great deal of it. He and a number of his predecessors have overseen years of poor workforce planning, cutting of hospital beds in many areas, and a consistent failure to recognise the approaching dangers of underfunding and under-resourcing social care. Beyond a &E, the situation is desperately concerning too. I have been helping one constituent who has been waiting over 80 weeks for arthroscopy surgery. 80 weeks, Cabinet Secretary, in serious pain, advising things are deteriorating by the day and depending on medication just to get through the day. I have written to the Cabinet Secretary about this case and he is unable to give this woman, this family, any idea, any date of when this vital operation may be able to take place. I'm going to say it again, 80 wait weeks this constituent has been waiting. And it is whole families who suffer. Whilst living with considerable pain, she struggles to support her daughter often relying on her husband to do things that she would love to do, love to be involved with. But it is worse than this constant pain. Imagine, imagine how this family feel that for 80 weeks they cannot do the things that they would wish with their own daughter. The physical pain and the mental distress, I think we can all think about that. Yet the chances of improving her situation seem to be dwindling with every passing day as she waits for an appointment that seems as if it will never come. And as I have said, the Cabinet Secretary himself is unable to offer anything to this woman. These are the human stories behind the statistics, stories that don't even warrant a headline anymore because they are now just so common. 
If the Health Secretary thinks this is acceptable and on top of that can't seem to do anything about a &E waiting times at over eight hours going into winter, with some as high as 12 hours, it is reasonable to ask why, why is he still in this job? We have lo seen lots of politicians lose and then miraculously regain their jo jobs down in London this week. Yet the bar here seems to be so high that it doesn't matter how consistently a minister fails, they are actually kept in post. I dread to think what would happen to ordinary workers in this country if they had made as many mistakes as this administration had made. Waiting times are a massive concern for so many of my constituents. Month after month, year after year, people are living with anxiety and concern about how they will get the treatment that we need. Remember those personal stories. And also that hardworking hostel staff are under huge pressure every day and it causes stress and anxiety to them as well. Yet it seems to be one of those things that people in this government just appear to accept as a force of nature. Nothing serious is ever done to address the problem. No actions are actually taken and it just comes back round to the next year. People truly value it. The, the, you can shout all you like. It is true. These are true stories that the members across this chamber are bringing here to have serious discussion with the Cabinet Secretary about how we move these forward. You do now need People to conclude, People truly Mr. value our NHS. This is, it, this is just not good enough. One in seven Scots are now stuck on NHS waiting lists. Sort it out or pass the responsibility to someone who can. Thank, Thank you, you very Deputy much, Martin, to be followed by Tess White again for up to four minutes. Ms. Thank you. Despite being the best performing A&E departments in the UK, Scottish Accident and Emergency Departments are facing capacity issues and not just in winter. I would like to put forward suggestions and thoughts based on conversations I have had with clinicians. Staff vacancies are the North East's biggest issue and we have a worrying situation in GP services in my constituency where a number of surgeries are struggling to treat patients because they have got so many unfilled posts. And one of the impacts of that is that patients who would otherwise receive GP care resort to turning up at A&E, putting even more pressure on that service. And, and that's one of the reasons why I would like to see the uh, Scott Gem programme expanded to include Grampian. And I note that a pay offer has been made to nurses by the Cabinet Secretary, and I, I really hope that it is ac accepted. But there are pressures on other parts of, of our staff as well. A wide range of people in the NHS have advised me that they have concerns that too many GPs and consultants are retiring far too early. And just today I spoke to a consultant in the NHS Grampian who is concerned that because of tax and pensions implications, consultants even from the age of 40 are reducing their hours. A reduction in consultant capacity obviously impacts A&E and I am concerned though that this might also impact any measures that the government is putting in place to give scheduled urgent appointments in hot clinics that are designed to relieve pressure in, in A&E. <laughs> If pensions arrangements are making it less attractive to stay on, that is going to impact on capacity and our budgets are stretched and finite. But we need to address any seemingly illogical contractual disincentives to work in full time and to retirement age. After all, we have invested in training these consultants. On to training, I recently hosted an event with the Royal College of Emergency Medicine and heard from an advanced clinical practitioner who pointed to the rollout of more ACPs being a vital to support emergency rooms. I am asking the Cabinet Secretary what can we do within the work of the Urgent Care and Unscheduled Care Collaborative to facilitate this. I really do welcome the £50 million funding that has been used to put in place ways to reduce A&E waiting times, including offering alternative to hospital-based treatment. But we do need to accept that there will always be a need for hospital-based treatment. In addition to more ACPs, we need to look at increasing postgraduate training places and target them at the areas where we have the biggest recruitment challenges. I have been told that these are respiratory, acute medicine and geriatrics. Now, Labour have this debate about winter planning and I realise that my contribution so far has pointed to long-term strategies. But what I have outlined will not just get us through this winter, but all subsequent winters. Labour also, uh, and also aid the recovery of the toughest period our NHS has ever known that cannot be ignored. No, COVID, not just COVID though, a very tough recruitment environment with Brexit, which presiding officer is the elephant in the room here. My NHS board colleagues in Grampian have consistently 
pointed to the damage that loss of freedom of movement has done to our NHS and social care systems. The Labour motion does not mention that because it is to their endless embarrassment that their leader does not care about taking us back into the EU common travel arrangements. And until they do, Labour have zero credibility when it comes to workforce issues affecting our NHS. Now, I have spoken before about how Labour always come to this chamber with a list of demands but no costed solutions. And to date, nearly 2.68 billion of social care demands that Labour have made and don't have the first clue on how to fund. I've got them here. But, presiding officer, today Jackie Bailey hasn't even come forward with any ideas for the A&E departments. Uncosted or not, not one single idea from Jackie Bailey or Carol Malkin. And one final point, presiding officer. Frankly, the last two words for the Labour motion and Jackie Bailey's speech are a disgrace. Every health secretary and every government is dealing with the same issues. Grubby personal attacks like this are the worst thing about this place, and it undermines the very idea of politics as a public service. Okay. Before we proceed, a further reminder that time is tight. You do need to stick to your speaking allocation, and we will not have shouting across the chamber from a sedentary position, from particularly the front benches, but that goes for the back benches too. I call Tess White to be followed by Alec Rowley for up to four minutes, please, Mr. Presiding Officer, it feels like Groundhog Day. Nicola Sturgeon told this chamber in September that she wanted to see immediate improvement in A&E waiting times. But for the third week in a row, more than 3,000 patients waited longer than eight hours to be seen in A&E. 1,350 patients waited in pain and distress for more than 12 hours, not in hospital beds, but in waiting rooms and corridors. These are shocking figures, not least because the Royal College of Emergency Medicine has repeatedly warned that waits like these can lead to hundreds of avoidable deaths each one a tragedy. And the current chaos is just the tip of the iceberg because the situation will only get worse as winter arrives. In September, well before the winter months, NHS Grampian in my region asked people to only attend emergency departments in life-threatening situations. Ambulances have been stacked outside ARI with paramedics treating patients parked outside A&E doors for hours, meaning they can't be dispatched elsewhere. But the reality is that A&E waiting times are the symptom of a wider malaise that the SNP have presided over for years. Poor workforce planning and a failure to get a grip on delayed discharge means there are simply aren't enough staff and beds to care for patients. You can only stretch an elastic band so far, and we have reached breaking point. It's abundantly clear that we need more social care staff now to help prevent bed blocking. But the SNP is instead diverting hundreds of millions, even billions. It seems that the Scottish govern Government isn't quite sure whether it's millions or billions of pounds into the creation of a national care service which won't be up and running for another four years. Meanwhile, cancer treatment waiting times are at their worst level on record. Waiting times for routine treatment are continuing to mount. More than a quarter of, a chul of children and young people are still not being seen by mental health services within 18 weeks. And people are having to wait hours, not minutes, for ambulances to arrive. With Humza Yusuf at the helm, our NHS is on its knees. NHS staff are working heroically with the resources they have to provide safe patient care. But those on the front line are telling us over and over again that the sim system simply isn't sustainable. Just last month, nurses tried to share their concerns with the health secretary about their increasing workloads, their pay situation and patient safety. Humza Yusuf shamefully told them not to patronise him. My blood boiled when I heard that. My sister is a nurse, another is a midwife. I speak to frontline staff every day, and this was just disgraceful. But for Humza Yusuf, it was just another photo op before retreating to the self-congratulation and platitudes of the SNP party conference. At the crisis, as the crisis facing our NHS has gone from bad to worse, 
The Scottish Conservatives have called many times for the Health Secretary to completely rethink his NHS recovery plan. We've urged him to go back to the drawing board on his N NHS winter resilience plan. Enough of the distraction and deflection. Hamza Youssef needs to step up. People's lives are at stake. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Alec Rowley to be followed by Gillian Mackay for up to four minutes. Mr Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. I have a few points to make in the short time that I have. Firstly, can I say that I welcome the fact that discussions are ongoing. There is an RP offer on the table. And whether it is this offer or a future one, I hope we can reach an agreement and get an agreement, because the last thing we need in our health service is industrial action. So I really, I really hope that happens. But I would make the point to the Health Secretary that I have met with frontline workers in health and social care. I have met the local trades unions and nationally. And they all stress to me it is not just about money. It is about the massive pressure upon which all these staff are currently working and being expected to work. And we have to address that um, to move forward. Now, I would acknowledge the impact of COVID. I would acknowledge that whoever was going to be in power, these are really difficult times. I would also acknowledge the impact of a disastrous Brexit. So there are major difficulties within the NHS that we all face. But I think the key issue is we've got to have the confidence that the government have actually got a grip on the issues and do have plans that will actually operate to tackle the problems. And that's the problem I have. I don't see the evidence that these plans are in place. Indeed, when it comes to social care, I'm not convinced this government's got a handle at all on what needs to happen. And that is a problem. I'll come to more of that. But the first point I would want to make is to the Tory party, the Scottish Tories, because the reality is that right now we have a crisis in this country that has been created in Downing Street, an economic crisis that is going to play very badly. The Daily Record, the Daily Record reported last week that we now have 216 official heat banks having been opened in addition to the fact that we have 244 food banks. Now, if we're going to go through this winter with people cold, people freezing, people not able to feed themselves, that is going to put massive pressure on our health service. And the, the, really, the, really, the really difficult thing for me is the Tories have tanked the economy, but they have the nerve. Please do not stand there and shout if you have something to I've say. Told say you. They have Mr. the Rayland. nerve to stand up and look into cameras with a straight face and say we are going to have to cut public services. I would hope this Parliament could unite to say that there should be no austerity on public services and that we will all join together and fight that austerity. But back to, back to the, the Scottish Government and where they are at. Firstly, in terms of care homes, care homes are in crisis. We have saw that. We saw Robert Kilgour on the news last night talking about the massive pressures that they are under. That is going to have to be addressed. But I want quickly to say it cannot be addressed by simply fleecing uh, self-funders, those who over £18,500 a year are having to pay for their own care. Because right now they are the only income source for those care homes. And sadly, their, their charges are increasing and there is no protection for it. So that must be addressed. In terms of social care itself, the inequality within social care between those working in the private sector and those working in the public sector must be addressed. You cannot continue to ignore that. And I have to say, the National Care Service proposal that you have brought forward is basically a national procurement service. That is not going to tackle the issues that we face right now. And I just looked this morning at the responses to the consultation. Everyone in that sector, all the professional you bodies, need to people conclude, that are Mr. using Riley. the sector, are warning you that. So you have to listen. That's the problem. In conclusion, people don't believe you have your handle on this or you have a grip on it. You need Thank to do you, that. Thank you, Mr. Rowley. I now call Gillian Mackay to be followed by David Torrance for up to four minutes. Ms. Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This will once again be one of the most difficult winters in the history of our NHS. 
an already, an already tired workforce, rising COVID-related admissions and a backlog of delayed and more complex treatment, as well as a battle to reduce A&E waiting times. As always, some health boards are doing better than others. Forth Valley in my region is one that is continually at the top of the table in terms of long waits, and we need to understand better why in this particular health board this is and support a sustained incremental difference in wait times rather than what we are seeing at the moment. Bad statistics one week, a marked improvement the following week, only for the cycle to continue to repeat itself. This is not delivering for patients and gives me great concern for the pressure clinical teams are being put under in these health boards to achieve lower waiting times when they are already stretched and tired. Keeping people out of acute settings in the first place should always be the primary goal. I attended a Marie Curie roundtable discussion at the start of this week with experience from unpaid carers and their organisations. We discussed the current issues faced for those who are caring for a loved one at home, an issue that was raised related to NHS 24 and access to that for people with a terminal diagnosis. Often carers or patients themselves are looking for guidance on whether the issue they currently have needs acute care or not. But because of waits for triaging, they often end up phoning an ambulance or taking their loved one to a &E. I believe some health boards, as part of anticipatory care planning, provide specific pathways for those with a terminal diagnosis to get the information they need. Given the number of people now wanting to die at home, I hope the Cabinet Secretary may look into this as one way to prevent people ending up at a and &E unnecessarily. I have previously raised staffing of out-of-hours GP services. This is a hugely valuable service that again diverts people away from a and &E and provides timely care. We need to make this an attractive option for GPs to work in. In their briefing, RCGP highlighted that they believe people are unaware of how to effectively navigate health and social care services. Many things have changed over the pandemic. Some services are not delivered in the same way, and pathways may have changed. I hope that some effort can be put into ensuring, especially over winter, that patients know where and when they can access the most appropriate care. Pharmacy First Model, for example, will be able to help with some minor ailments over the winter, again reducing the potential impact on GPs. We should also acknowledge those in different parts of community care that are working extremely hard to make sure their patients remain well. District nurses doing home visits, changing bandages and monitoring people's conditions, school nurses dealing with a vast range of issues across multiple schools, health visitors providing advice and guidance for new parents. They are all contributing to the system, as well as the brilliant allied health professionals and support staff within, without whom the NHS simply would not work. We need to make sure that staff can take their breaks, that they have time for peer support and can access wellbeing measures that help to relieve the physical and mental toll they experience. Pay is very important, but having spoken to nurses from the RCN outside the building before recess, their working conditions and terms and conditions are really important too. And I will continue to work with RCN members on this. To conclude, Presiding Officer, we need to ensure this winter that we reduce waiting times as far as possible without putting more undue pressure on a tired workforce. And we need to ensure that all avenues for access to care are well advertised and communicated. Thank you, Ms Mackay. I now call David Torrance to be followed by Edward Mountain. Up to four minutes, Mr Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. Before I begin, I would like to pay tribute to our outstanding health and social care workers across Scotland. The last few years have seen an immense strain put on their health care system and its workers. But despite these stresses and in the face of unprecedented and unimaginable challenges, they have continued to provide an exceptional service. As we look ahead in the, into this winter, the challenges that we will bring, no one in this chamber is under any illusions about what difficulty is going to be. We all know that extremely tough times lie ahead. This winter, it will take a combined efforts of national and local government working alongside all our health care partners to tackle the challenges that lie ahead. But make no mistake, while Labour stand here today and criticise, despite what we would, would like us to believe, it is not just here in Scotland that health care staff and services are under strain. The NHS in every part of the United Kingdom is facing significant pressure. But to mind, similarities end there. Why? What separates us from other parts of the UK? We have a Scottish Government that cares. A government has a strong and steady leadership, 
a government with plans, and the Health Secretary recognises the challenges that lie ahead and is totally committed to improving performance and delivering positive change. Put that into contrast with our English counterparts, and I know who I would trust to safeguard the health and well-being of my family, friends and loved ones. Labour have highlighted their concerns about our A&E departments. What you won't hear in the, the, the knowledge is that our accident and emergency departments are performing better than those in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. In Scotland, the staffing levels of NHS have grown for 10 consecutive years, and while staffing and funding is already at historical high levels, as we approach the winter period, the Scottish Government will continue to look to modernise and enhance whatever possible. No, thank you. You know why I won't take an intervention? When you went in a coalition with the Tories and the Council Through the Chair, Mr Torrance, Torrance, through the Chair. It is recognised by his Government that the current level of the performance is not acceptable. No one here will deny that. That is why earlier this month the Health Secretary outlined in this Winter Resilience Overview several actions for the coming winter months, all backed by more than £600 million of funding. By April this year, more than 1,000 additional health care support staff and almost 200 registered nurses have been recruited to help address the challenges of our services. Staffing levels have increased by more than 2,800 permanent whole time equivalent roles in the past year. The Scottish Government is also investing in further recruitment and taking action through the £50 million urgent and unscheduled care collaborative. I have listened today with interest and some disbelief as my Labour colleagues speak of thousands of beds de delays lost due to delayed discharge. I get a sense that in their desire to criticise and condemn the Scottish Government, they may be lacking some self-awareness. There can be no doubt that the impact of Brexit and the introduction of new UK immigration procedures have had a profoundly damaging e effect on social care. And yet the Labour Party continue to eagerly embrace the Tories' extreme Brexit and all of its overwhelming negative impacts. EU workers have a hugely positive contribution to, in the care sector for many years and represent a vital component of our country's social care workforce. But Brexit and the yearning of the Tory party to take back control of the UK has created a shortfall in care services, which in turn has severe knock-on effects on emergency and urgent care. The whole system comes blocked when there are not enough care workers to support themselves leave those leaving hospital, leading to gridlock and a backlog through the entire system. When people can't leave hospital due to lack of social care, patients are stuck in A&E while they wait in a hospital bed, and while those needing an ambulance are then left waiting because they are waiting on transfers of patients. Yet only this week we all heard Keir Stammer's determined and short-sighted answer of it's a straight no when asked about rejoining the EU showing that Labour and the Tories are increasingly just two sides of the same coin, both completely unwilling to stand up and do what is best for the people of Scotland. <laughs> just imagine what our NHS could do with the £770 million a year that is currently spent mitigating Tory policies. In you need to conclude. Side, officer, you need to conclude. Our NHS has suffered the biggest shock of its 74-year existence and will not recover overnight, as has been acknowledged by this government. Thank you, Mr Torrance. I now call Edward Mountain to be followed by Emma Harper for up to four minutes, Mr Mountain. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And first of all, I'd like to pay tribute to all our frontline staff in the NHS. Routine or emergency treatment, they never falter. Last year, my personal contact with the NHS allowed me to see how hard they work. But what is clear to me is that our frontline staff do not have the resources they need. That means there are too many patients that struggle to get seen, to get diagnosed, and worse still, to get prompt treatment. Overworked GPs are often can't see the person in person. Carrying out a diagnosis on a computer is a risky business. GPs need to see patients, and whilst near me and other online portals might work, let me tell you, being told you have cancer on a telephone in your parliamentary office sucks, as does waiting 10 days for a follow-up appointment. As the NHS comes under increased pressure and face crisis management, there is a real danger that the first thing that is sacrificed is human care. It is that personal approach, that bedside manner, that patients not only need, but staff so want to deliver, that suffers. Not providing the resources to allow staff to deliver that care is in itself a dereliction of duty, your duty, Cabinet Secretary. Now, we all recognise the pressures of COVID, but the health service was under extreme pressure before COVID. Every winter, we face the inevitable and predictable rise in patients. Every year, this government guddled around trying to find solutions. 
Every year, they said they were listening and learning. The trouble is, whilst they might have been listen, listening, they certainly didn't hear, and they certainly were never learning. Now, Cabinet Secretary, you will say your winter plan will result in the recruitment of 1,000 extra staff and provide £120 million extra to provide help at home. Where exactly are you going to get those Through staff the from? Through the chair, please, Mr Mountain. Sorry. Where exactly will the Cabinet Secretary get those staff from, and how will the additional funds be judged to providing the care at home that is so desperately needed? Turning to delayed discharges, another perennial problem, and one that this Government has failed to address. This Government promised to eradicate them in 2015, but successive Health Secretaries, including the current Health Secretary, have failed miserably to address them. Numbers remain at almost a record high. In NHS Highland alone, there has been a 32% increase in delayed discharges in this year alone. One word covers this, failure, this government's failure. Every treated patient in hospital waiting for a social care package is stopping another patient on the waiting list from getting treatment. Longer waits, delayed treatment, results without doubt in less optimal outcomes. Cabinet Secretary, your government's failure on de less de delayed discharges is now very much your failure. Presiding officer, across Scotland, waiting times in A&E are going up. Cancer waiting times are going up. Nurse vacancies are going up. They're all going in the wrong direction, up. So the real question is, when will the Cabinet Cabinet Secretary for Health, stop dragging our NHS down, which it seems to be the only thing that he's capable of doing. Thank you, Sonny. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Mountain. I now call Emma Harper, the final speaker in the open debate, for up to four minutes. Ms. Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Well, here we are again, another politically opportunistic motion from the Labour Party politicising our health service here in Scotland. Contrary to the motion, the Health Secretary and the team are focused on ensuring Scotland's NHS is as well equipped as possible to tackle the huge challenges we face. And I know there are challenges. You know, taking care of people, the processes, the pathways, the prevention of acute admissions, the work in primary care, the work that my former colleagues undertake every day. It's so complex and the systems are challenging. I was in NHS Scotland, England and a nurse in the USA for 30 years before coming here. So I think I know a wee bit about what's going on in our National Health Service. And sometimes when I'm reading these motions, I wonder if the, the opposition can diddly quack quack about what is actually going on. So I know that over the last two years, the NHS has suffered the biggest shock in its 74 years of existence. And I want to thank the work and the care and the compassion and the commitment of all the people that work in the NHS and what they do every day. The Scottish Government's recovery plan is backed by over a billion pounds of investment and it sets out plans for health and care over the next five years. So it's not just for this winter. The plan will support inpatient day case and outpatient activity and the implementation of sustainable improvements and new models of care through investing in a network of national treatment centres. This will increase capacity for additional specialties, including diagnostics, general surgery, orthopaedics and ophthalmology. The plan also supports the mental health and well-being of the health and care workforce. And we have heard so much about that in the last couple of years as well. And so to look at ways to support people using digital opportunities like NHS Near Me is something that we should actually you know, get right behind. It is welcome and crucial that we need to help equip our NHS for the winter pressures, but again, it's beyond the winter that we need to be thinking about as well. And on specific A&E challenges, I hear what is being said. You know, in common with other health services across the UK and globally, A&E departments are working under significant pressure and the pandemic does continue to affect services. Mind that word, it's called COVID. We do need to remember the impact that the COVID pandemic has had and is still having on our National Health Service. 
I now know the Scottish Government has taken action to improve a and weights, and the £50 million urgent and unscheduled care collaborative will help implement a range of measures to drive down the a and waiting times. This work includes offering alternatives to hospital, such as hospital at home, directing people to urgent care settings, and scheduling urgent appointments to avoid long waits in A&E. I know about the long waits in A&E. I hear it directly from former colleagues and folk working in there in 12-hour shifts. It is hugely challenging. You know, in August, Scotland's core A&Es were 8.1 per cent points better than England and 10.3 percentage points better than Wales. So in Labour-controlled Wales, A&E waiting times for the same period as Scotland were worse. So I wonder if Jackie Bailey or anybody on the Labour benches can clarify when they're closing if they will call on the Welsh Labour Secretary to resign also. You know, Labour's performance in Wales does not inspire confidence for them doing any better here in Scotland. Presiding officer, I am conscious of time, but I note what Gillian Martin has said about potential solutions, and I welcome the steps the Scottish Government are taking to support our NHS. I want our Health Secretary to listen to the clinicians directly for their ideas and suggestions to help improve the systems, but we do need to get right behind our staff and our NHS workforce and support them in any way we can help in the future. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed, Ms Harper. We now move to the closing speeches. I call Craig Hoy for up to four minutes. Mr. Thank Hoy. you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Scotland's NHS faces its worst winter on record, and it faces this because of the SNP Government. It faces this because of the wrong choices made by this Health Secretary, choices which have led to the worst cancer waiting times ever, the worst ambulance waiting times ever, and a workforce that is demoralised and unappreciated, where nurses are threatening to strike for the first time in history. This Government has chosen the path of poor terms and low pay. Deputy Presiding Officer, critically ill patients in the most severe category are being forced to wait hours for an ambulance. Tens of, thousand, no, I won't. Tens of thousands of people waited over four hours to be seen at A&E uh, waiting uh, units last month, and hundreds of cancer patients have waited over two months to begin urgent treatment. According to the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, delays in Scotland's A&E departments last month meant that 40 people died who need not have died. Cumulatively, our NHS isn't just facing a crisis this winter, it is facing a catastrophe. Week after week, the SNP and Greens continue to waste millions of pounds of public money. Millions of pounds put at risk on the wrong no, millions of pounds put at risk on the wrong choice for social care. Millions wasted on a campaign for Scottish independence. Millions wasted on fake foreign embassies and overseas junkets. Millions wasted millions wasted by the SNP on botched ferries wrongly contracted against the advice of civil servants. This didn't come about by chance. This came about by choice, the SNP's choice. The wrong choices locally, the wrong choices nationally. In South Scotland, I will give way. Minister. If Mr Hoy would add to his list and look at some of the things that have happened recently uh, south of the border because of the incompetence of the Tory party, like £65 billion pounds yeah. having to be spent to prop up Mr. Hoy. pension funds Mr. Hoy. because of trustonomics. Why not focus on the £41 billion pounds that you have here in Scotland to make our public services better? Perhaps you Mr Stewart, you've had an intervention. Be quiet. The, the, the Minister's not in an Aberdeen nightclub now. He should behave. It, the, uh, the, the wrong Mr. choices Hoy. are being made time and time again. Wrong choices like the closure of beds in the minor injuries clinic at Eddington Cottage Hospital in North Berwick. They make the wrong choices for residents time and time again. And the calamity of all calamities is coming in the form of the National Care Service. The SNP are choosing a National Care Service over local care, and all because they choose centralisation at every turn. Don't take my word for it. Let's look at what COSLA and Unison say. For the sake of those individuals and families who need our support, waiting four or five years for the establishment of the National Care Service is not an option. We cannot and should not break up the local government workforce particularly at this critical time in our recovery from the pandemic. Deputy Presiding Officer, independent researchers from the Scottish Parliament estimate that the SNP's proposal to create a national care service will cost up to £1.3 billion over the next five years. And even the nodding dogs on the SNP's backbenches conceded this yesterday in the Finance Committee. 
the Minister knows only too well that he is on the wrong path. Scotland needs a well-funded, high-quality health service. Mr Hoy, sit down. Point of order, Gillian Martin. Is it not incumbent on MSPs to treat other MSPs with respect? Ms Martin, I'm not sure that is a point of order, but it is absolutely the case that members should be treating each other with respect, and that goes for absolutely everyone. Mr Hoy, continue and conclude. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Scotland needs a well-funded, high-quality health service where care is delivered closer to patients, where staff feel rewarded and valued, and where patients are treated quickly and safely. In short, an NHS where big choices are driven by patient care, not the independence obsession of this incompetent SNP government and this incompetent Health Secretary. Thank you. I now call the Cabinet Secretary for up to four minutes. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, can I, uh, I'm not going to respond to some of those uh, personal attacks because it's a shame that uh, a debate of such importance, such seriousness, has seen such pathetic, grubby uh, personal attacks. Not just on me, but on members right across this chamber. And, uh, it's a shame because it does no service whatsoever to our hard-working NHS staff yeah. who are working under uh, incredible pressure. Let me tackle some of the issues that have been raised that are um, uh, very, uh, very important to all of us uh, right across this chamber. On cancer, uh, of course, statistics continue to show that notwithstanding the huge impacts of the pandemic, that we're still continuing to meet those 31-day targets. We are not meeting the 62-day targets. They still remain absolutely challenging. And that's why our focus, my focus, has been on the Detecting Cancer Early programme. It's why we invested and I announced £10 million to improve cancer waiting times. That's on top of the £114.5 million in the National Cancer Plan. That's why uh, I announced three rapid cancer diagnostic services and two more uh, have just been approved. So we'll continue that relentless focus on ensuring cancer is detected early because we know if it is, then it leads to better outcomes and survivability for people. On oh, winter funding, I was astonished by what Jackie Bailey uh, had to say. She complained that there's no new money. She complained that I announced all of the money last year. Of course, it was Jackie Bailey who demanded last year that money be recurring, that winter pressure money was recurring for this winter. Yeah. And now she's standing up complaining that that same yeah. money has been recurring. You can't have it both ways. I'll give way to Jackie. Jackie Bailey. I mean, everybody, including yourself, is saying that this is going to be the worst winter ever. Surely this is a point at which to put additional resource in to cope with that so patients don't suffer. Cabinet Secretary. That's why this financial year we have a record £18 billion being spent on yeah. the health service. And what I say to Jackie Bailey is you don't just wake up one day and say, oh, it's going to be a bad winter. You plan for it the year before. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. why we ensured we had recurring money. Uh, 1,000 additional staff. Recruiting, oh, recruited over the course of this winter. Uh, Edward Mountain, as opposed to being on his phone, asked, might want to listen because he asked, where does that money come from? Uh, where did those staff come from? Of course, those 1,000 staff, 750 of them, will be recruited from overseas. And that is because boards tell us they have the capacity to bring people over from uh, overseas, and 250 of them will be domestically recruited. I want to touch on Alex Rowley's uh, contribution. I thought it was a very fair contribution, actually. Uh, and, and actually showed that there's a willingness from some in the Labour Party to get into, uh, to come forward with actual ideas yeah. uh, and solutions potentially for the social care sector and the national care service. What I will say to Alex Shirley, there's no silver bullet. If there was, I promise him we would have deployed it by now. But our relentless focus is on workforce, 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 because that is a challenge. But I cannot disassociate those workforce challenges from uh, the folly of Brexit. Yeah. We know, and, and, and Kevin Stewart was reminding me of the fact that one care home provider uh, telling him that 40% of his staff uh, had to leave uh, largely down uh, to Brexit and he lost yeah. them due to Brexit. So our focus will be on uh, the social care uh, sector and pay will be a part of that. That's why I cannot give away, I, I virtually have to uh, finish in, in less than a minute. Uh, what I will say is that we will have a relentless focus on pay, terms and conditions, whether it's the, in the NHS or social care. Uh, and I'll uh, conclude my remarks shortly, uh, Presiding Officer, but I cannot, I cannot let the Conservatives get away with talking about social care and talking about our public finance. How dare, how dare they come to this chamber yeah. and utter one syllable or one word about the challenges our public finances serve, uh, face through their incompetence, through their economic mismanagement, yeah. through their economic vandalism. Yeah. My health budget is worth £650 million less than when it was set in yeah. December last year. So why don't they grow a backbone and instead of waiting for the next 
number 10 incumbent to tickle their tummy? Why don't they try standing up for Scotland and stand up for our public services? Thank I will you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call Chester on Paul O'Kane to conclude the wind-up debate for up to five minutes. Mr O'Kane. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our NHS is facing a humanitarian crisis this winter, and let's be frank, the responsibility lies at the door of this Government and this Cabinet Secretary. And yet again today we have heard the scale of the crisis in our NHS. We have heard from Jackie Bailey about the personal cost behind each and every one of those numbers. Each a person with a family, their own story, cared for by our amazing staff in our NHS who are at breaking point. I think today's debate has been characterised by uh, the Cabinet Secretary's, I have to say, thin skin. You know, he complains that he's been personally attacked. The reality is all Jackie Bailey and this side did was point out his failures in comparison to his predecessors in the Health Secretary's job, including Jean Freeman, who led the country through the beginning of the pandemic. Alex Cole Hamilton did similar in his remarks when he pointed out what Paul Gray has had to say about um, the head of steam that has built, the perfect storm that's been created. It isn't all about COVID. And I'd like to make some progress. Um, I'm just coming to the point about the reality is that what we've heard from the SNP this afternoon, or from their backbenchers, is that they've accused us of political attacks. But let's be honest, what we've heard is desperate stuff from them. They accuse us of political attacks. And all we've had from the backbenchers is howls of red Tory, as Carol Mocking made her contribution, nonsense comparisons with Wales and England, and attacks on Keir Starmer, so scared are they of a UK Labour government. So we are not going to take lectures from a party who have spent this debate indulging in what about today, refusing to acknowledge their responsibility for every single person who is lying on a trolley in a &E this winter. The Cabinet Secretary said in his remarks that he prepares for winter in advance. So can he tell us why Dr John Thompson, the Vice Chair of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, has stated that the measures outlined in his Winter Resilience Plan will, and I quote, not be in place in time to prevent further harm to patients and staff this winter? Yes, Presiding Officer, the experts are clear. Gillian Martin calls for solutions backed by the experts. Absolutely. I went outside and met with the RCN when they protested in front of Parliament. And do you know what they told me? They told me that they need more training places filled, that they need a fair pay settlement across all bands. And they have told me that they need proper breaks and proper rest when they're on shift because they're not getting them at the moment and the workforce is on its knees. But perhaps we should describe to Emma Harper's attitude and not listen to the hardworking staff and their trade unions. I'm quite sure they will make diddly quack of whatever her contribution was supposed to be about. Let's be honest, presiding officer. The issue across our NHS is being exacerbated by the Scottish Government's refusal to engage on pay, whether it's with nurses or whether it's in social care, refusing to back Scottish Labour's pledge to pay social care workers £15 an hour, a wage that they can live on, not just a wage that they have to survive on. And the Scottish Government have also failed in wider regards in social care. They have failed to implement key recommendations of the Philly report, and there are serious concerns across their approach to the National Care Service, which have been outlined by trade unions, the third sector, professional bodies. And it's clear, as Alec Riley and others outlined, that they are currently not listening to what is being said about the serious challenges in social care. And all of this begs the question, if the government isn't going to listen to the advice of independent experts in the field, who are they going to listen to? Presiding officer, Hamza Yusuf is a record breaker. I think that's fair to say. Week after week, we see record-breaking accident and emergency waiting times. Every time Scottish Labour is forced to bring this debate to the Chamber, we have another record broken by this Cabinet Secretary. It's quite clear that in place of meaningful action to address the crises in A&E, in social care and across our NHS, all the Cabinet Secretary has to offer is hollow words. It's increasingly obvious that Hamza Yusuf is a man with no plan. I'm sure most of the members in the chamber could have preempted the Cabinet Secretary's response before he got to his feet. If you don't like one of his excuses, he has others. First it was COVID, then Brexit, then the cost of living, then winter weather, then staffing. It's the same old script which does a disservice to healthcare, staff, patients and families of patients who have real concerns over the current crisis in our NHS. <laughs> Presiding officer, it is not good enough. We need a health secretary who can offer leadership, not one who hides behind tired, old, scripted excuses. 
The First Minister is fond of saying that the buck stops with the government, although she really does anything other than look at the buck and watch it float by. So in the Cabinet Secretary's own words to hard-working nurses, let's not patronise one another. The buck stops with him, and if he is not willing to get on and fix the situation in the NHS, then he should resign. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr O'Kane. That concludes the debate on uh, supporting the NHS in winter. It's now time to move on to the next item of business. There will be a brief pause while the front benches change.